Hi there, I'm Anthony Chung and I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading. Every weekday morning I'll deliver a fundamental rundown ahead of the European Open. But if you subscribe to the channel, you'll also get content from the rest of the team. So, let's begin. Okay, very good morning guys. It is Thursday 24th September, hope you're doing well. Uh, just gone through 7am now in London, so a quick review of some of the major headlines, how we closed overnight on Wall Street performance in Asia and then expectations for the day ahead and we'll run through a couple of charts. From a news perspective, actually not too much for me to talk about, so gonna predominantly focus on a couple of charts that'll be marking up uh, some key downside levels that I think would be prudent to keep an eye on in the likes of the NASDAQ and S&P future. Uh, we can have a, a look at the FX charts and gold, silver continue to pull back as well, continuing of their, their recent downside trend. Um, otherwise, just looking at the general sentiment here at the open, it is a touch negative. Um, DAX future down about 150 this morning. Uh, US index futures also in negative territory. NASDAQ 64, the S&P 11 points at the moment. Albeit Treasury is pretty flat, um, oil not really seeing too much direction, uh, despite the, the general move that we saw yesterday, volatility uh, that was seen around the infantry release, we actually drifted lower as the session progressed, uh, just generally through the late US session into the Asian hours. I think a lot of that generally is what's reflected for the overall narrative for the Open this morning, which is about uh, the apprehension of what the, the economic situation, the recovery might look, quite, look like without now forthcoming fiscal stimulus, which is one of the key things we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, but oil overall, uh, actually fairly range bound. Uh, the bottom end of that range around the 39.19 type area has been holding really around, despite Monday low print at 38.87, uh, the market's respected really 39.19 over the last two days. Uh, we bounced up towards pivot at the moment. Um, Dixie is up. Um, about one tenth of one percent. So not too much in terms of an intraday movement thus far. However, what I would say is that it's continuing to maintain some of the gains that we're seeing over recent sessions, and that has then, as a consequence, keeping a bit of a, uh, a pressure on those major uh, currency pairs like euro, dollar, and cable, which we'll look at in a moment. All right. Well, look. Let's get straight into some of the main stories here. Uh, I'm going to start off with the the Fed pleads anew for stimulus and markets start to give up hope. So yeah, what exactly is happening here? So yesterday, um, US equities did finish uh, it's a, quite a decent move lower. The S&P was down about 2.4, the NASDAQ was down over 3%, Dow just shy of two. Um, Asian stocks followed suit, uh, and it's all coming after uh, numerous Fed officials really were uh, stressing that more fiscal stimulus is critical to sustaining the economic recovery, none more so than, of course, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, who's been speaking all week and will be speaking again uh, to US politicians later on today. Uh, this comes as the fiscal kind of impulse in the US starts to wane and some of these expectations for a slow and steady recovery start to be uh, just tested at the moment. Uh, a couple of other things to be aware of. US Congress, according to CNN, uh, is reportedly readying to leave Washington as early as this week until after the election and therefore would not be able to put through any type of coronavirus relief. And also, of course, going back right to the beginning of the week, um, the chances of aid uh, fading further after what we saw at the end of last week, which was the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, and that's put the fight over the Supreme Court right at the epicenter at the moment of US politics meaning then that stimulus talks are getting bumped somewhat into the background uh, because of the importance then that the composition over the Supreme Court will, will have for the US election. And so all of that has kind of, if you like, pushed back this expectation of forthcoming stimulus and markets have become very dependent on that given the large scope of the reaction that we've had since the onset of the pandemic and also given the fact that we were talking about numbers in the multiple trillions only a few weeks ago, and now it's looking more and more likely that not even anything will come. And so I think that's just adding a little bit of apprehension to the market and then to throw into the mix. The other headline of note um, from the US is Donald Trump has refused to commit to a peaceful transfer of power if he loses the election, sparking further concern about the, the, the general length of delay that's going to be caused by this male 
um, mail-in ballot system. So all of these things kind of coming together. And, and yesterday, I'm going to look at the S&P here to start with. Um, we, after the Europeans left the market, uh, things started to, to sour. Um, technically, we broke through the, the kind of double bottom that held a lot of the price activity in the futures market from um, this would have been Tuesday session. That did then see a quite an aggressive break lower. Um, since that point, then we initially hit a uh, further extension of selling pressure in the Asian session before bouncing. So in the near term range now in the spoos, uh, we're kind of looking at 32, 39 a quarter and 32.10. Uh, that low has held so far, both as an Asian low and European opening low. But we're definitely worth keeping a close eye on because I was just looking at on a, on a daily continuation. Um, there's a really big level, really, is that 31.92. Uh, and the reason I've been looking at this is because of that area of respected support that it provided the S&P through mid to late July, as you can see here. Um, and that was really quite critical to hold the market up uh, at that point in time. So if we see further downside pressure, that will be a really big um, area to keep an eye on because a break of that, then the selling pressure could get heavy quite quickly. Uh, but that could be then a firm area where the market might respond in kind to stabilize um, and whether bounce, but perhaps consolidate a little bit after what has been quite a, a run lower here uh, more recently. Uh, sticking with the US equity theme then, let's have a look at the NASDAQ. I've been also um, looking at that this morning uh, and as per usual, it outperforms, it underperforms and yesterday very similar, losses of over 3% giving the, the quite a decent move lower that we saw yesterday. Um, at the moment, in terms of the, the futures, we have still got a little way to go. The S1 would be a near-term level of significance that coinciding with the low point that was seen on Monday afternoon, just after the first hour of Wall Street trade uh, for the commencement of the week. But if you start looking on a daily continuation here, so just stepping back onto a higher time frame, I think there's a really big level. If we were to break first of all, um, so if we're zooming in, uh, first area of course is gonna be here, which is the Monday low and the S1 uh, on the daily pivots. If we break there, that's the first real test of support zone, but then that opens the door for a challenge deeper down to a really, again, critical level, much in a similar fashion to the S&P, I'd say 10, 5, 14. So what we have here is the red line, that's the 100 DMA, and we have been sandwiched at the moment in the, the NASDAQ between the 50 and the 100 DMA. The 50 you can see is held um, both on Friday, on Tuesday, and um, in yesterday's session. So the fiscal hopes fading, just moving back lower technically the 50 dma providing some resistance here to the price action uh, in the nasdaq future and as we come back down a break of monday low you've got the Ju late july uh, lows coinciding with that 100 dma that i'd be keeping an eye on in that rectangle there would be quite key uh, any further break and push down through that level i'd then be eyeing 10 to 96 which would be that low print on the depth of the eu covid fears we saw materialize in mid-july that would coincide then with the uh, resistance we had in mid-June before then the eventual break came at the beginning of July. So these are, would be the key levels I'd be watching. Uh, obviously, markets can move very quickly if the the kind of sentiment does shift and we continue, uh, you know, if it, it gets exacerbated by key technical level breaches. So hence the reason why I think it's it's prudent to be looking at these levels now rather than, than later. Uh, sticking with the charts, let's have a quick look elsewhere. Gold and silver in the commodity space have drawn a lot of attention recently, uh, just because of we we were in we were in quite a long period of relative, although large range, kind of consolidation. But we've now broken below there, and you can see really uh, the bottom end of that range that was holding through uh, kind of the the third fourth week of August, the first second week of Sep, having broken now around that 1920 area has provided a bit of. Um, area of resistance now before this push down. Importantly, for yesterday's session, through the COMEX Open, we broke through the actual low point that we saw back on the 12th, which was the the bottom of the route that we saw on that big day of sell-off on the, um, the kind of unwinding of the big push-up that we had on the breach through 2000 up to near 2100. So that's now broken. That is somewhat 
uh, symbolic in in nature and since that point we have continued to push down a, another 25 bucks or so um, if we were looking at the the near-term price levels uh, I know it's a bit difficult to see here with my, my camera feed so let me see if I can quickly just remove that for one moment so here then if I just broaden out the chart um, the next levels I'd be looking at in gold you got the s1 in the futures and that would be seen down at 40 1845 and that starts to encapsulate then some of this uh, top end of the range that we were seeing uh, back really in mid-June or mid-July, excuse me. So that's definitely a key area here around 45 to 47. Any break of there, we could very quickly see a move back down to the S2, which would be also around the bottom end of the range from that same July period of consolidation that we were seeing. Uh, so that's how I'd be looking at that if we continue to move lower. If we bounce today, then I'll be looking at the reversal of some of these moves, the pivot then and 74 to 77 I'd be looking at, which was that initial break low that we had. If we start looking on a monthly chart, uh, it probably looks a little bit more clearer. Uh, obviously we've had this quite big reversal as the persistent dollar strength has really been weighing on some of these precious metals here. Um, and so if we continue to move lower, obviously the, the really big area of support on a, on a higher time frame would be down at around the 1800 or in this case 1795, which would of course be uh, the key area of which then uh, acted as resistance but then catapulted prices higher from a technical perspective uh, only around two months ago or so. In terms of silver, obviously things have been particularly uh, violent. Um, you know, these are these are all old markups that I had from when we were rallying at the time. But you can see the pullback now um, is is looking increasingly more um, kind of violent. Particularly the the, the sell off that we've seen so far this week, drifting from 26 all the way back down to 22s now. So if we continue to come down lower, I'd probably be keeping an eye on 21. 21 being uh, this area here of resistance we had back on the 5th of July. Any breakdown further through there, then I think it opens the prospect down to 19, which starts to encapsulate that previous uh, area of resistance that was really containing price action and saw quite an explosive break on the, the eventual move through there that we saw uh, back in the, the start of July. So there's definitely a little bit more room, I think, for these precious metals to come down. Contingent, of course, on continuation of some of the dollar moves but just given the, the, the way of which gold and silver have been moving through the last couple of months yeah, another dollar and a half move lower here in silver definitely is not off the cards and as I said with gold I don't think it would be that surprising to at least get down another 10 bucks to test around those levels here uh, close to the S1 and that previous highs that we we're seeing in July um, in the intraday session. Um, in the FX markets uh, just going to have a quick look. I, I will give you an update um, regarding the news to do with the UK. Obviously, this is just the chart we had yesterday, but just looking, things haven't really changed from here, uh, what we were discussing the other day. So the 200 DMA continues to remain quite a, uh, a decent marker, um, not only because yesterday we fluctuated through it, but we closed below it. And I think that was very important. And so when we reopen commencement of trade today, again, the 200 DMA providing some resistance. And we've just continued to just edge lower. The change on the session is only around 20 pips. But if the dollar does continue its appreciation, then it should continue to weigh here because fundamentals for sterling obviously are not looking great at the moment. So that rectangle is still in play. Um, the market did respond to that um, when we were looking at it um, yesterday which is around that kind of 126.53 type area, which starts to encapsulate then some of those previous highs that we had in April, but also more near term through July uh, would definitely be important. Uh, again, contingent on um, a technical breach, but dollar strength, there's not a lot then. If we get through this zone of support then for, for cable, we've got the 126 handle psychologically and then really opens up the prospects of the push down. So it's been a little bit choppy yesterday, but overall, if you actually look at the trend that's materialized this week, certainly um, cable has come considerably lower. Um, you know, we were starting the week up at around a 130 type handle. We're now trading down at around 127 overall. So the fundamentals are kind of playing out in that, in that respect. Um, looking at the Euro, Euro's uh, been under pressure, of course, uh, with the uh, the resurgent kind of dollar. 
uh, near term near term to the price action at the moment I'd probably be keeping an eye on um, this kind of level here and then here if we see any reversal back up to the upside uh, at the moment the trend definitely is lower uh, and just looking on a slightly higher time frame here I mean again this week has really been dominated by a bit of a bounce in the greenback um, and here I think we're at a, a fairly significant level you can see if we go all the way back here on the left hand side this is going back actually to um, October of 2018 uh, that was also where we closed on the uh, daily on the 24th and so quite an interesting level here at the near term any breakdown through there I'd be looking at a uh, slightly deeper move down to uh, 116.33s which would be then putting us back to the initial January 2019 high uh, on a slightly higher time frame but yeah let me get you up to speed then with a couple of other headlines that's the chart so hopefully that's useful I'm going to start talking about the UK a little bit um, first looking at the COVID rates um, certainly as as we were kind of um, talking about throughout the whole week uh, case numbers continue to rise yesterday reported at 6200 type level this is one of the this is actually one of the highest levels ever that we've had registered in just one single day as you can see from the uh, kind of height of the, the period of the initial lockdown and the worst case numbers we we're seeing in April um, this does come though with a bit of a caveat I don't think it actually you know a chart like this I think is very misleading because it actually would suggest that cases now it would be if you're looking at it just purely on the the pattern of the trend you would say well now's just as bad as before and I don't think that that's the case because um, what happens now in terms of the volume of testing the awareness the ability of people to go and get checks uh, this kind of setup of infrastructure facilities I think is radically different from where we were when there was none of that going back into March April period the point being is now um, and, and this is backed by um, the science from Imperial College London where researchers have suggested that um, in actuality probably back in April May there were more likely to be around a hundred thousand new infections a day it was just the case that there wasn't enough um, testing to to see those numbers reflected in the actual um, overall kind of data because uh, remember the death count now from where the death count was then is radically different of course so it, this 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 number is going to get um, way higher than the daily count, case count that was officially registered here but I don't think that necessarily should really be a, a too much surprise if you understand actually how the metrics are, are measured Hospitalizations though are on the rise and the death count is gradually increasing uh, but again this is kind of what's been spooking the market and caused that movement lower this week already so really it's about now how quickly it further accelerates at this point. Uh, I was looking at some of the headlines this morning generally related to UK and coronavirus and obviously a lot of universities went back and there was recently Freshers Week and I think there's a lot of universities which actually have had quite um, um, isolated outbreaks um, into the hundreds of students um, of course that was one of the key risks given the generally a lot of the new case numbers were related to that type of uh, age demographic but hospitalizations here as you can see in England overall the number is still um, relatively um, low in the grander scheme of things but the point is is about how quickly it, that it has risen over the last two weeks or so and is likely to rise further still on the COVID front, of course, uh, and this I think is adding, it's not just that markets are slightly tentative at the moment on the back of a lack of fiscal forthcoming um, um, kind of program in the US, which I think ultimately is very key, but also COVID is not just a UK situation, it's also impacting mainland Europe at the moment. Um, Dutch cases are now spiking, and generally before they've been relatively well contained. France is preparing a further shutdown, German numbers are going up. So all of this, of course, is um, a kind of reshaping then uh, the idea that the economic recovery, what it was looking like a few weeks, months ago, is looking a little bit different now because of the fact that naturally as these virus starts to show and numbers start to increase, then governments need to respond in kind by uh, imparting further restrictions like what we've seen in the UK and that's going to impede that, that uh, 
recovery story. Um, the Chancellor is going to be speaking today, uh, Rishi Sunak. Um, he's going to be speaking at around 12.30 London time is my understanding. Um, he is going to set out to MPs today um, a new scheme to subsidise wages of people in part-time work, replacing the furlough programme that ends at the end of October. So this is exactly what we were talking about yesterday or the day before, which was the CBI's plan for basically um, helping a kind of a part-time structure because he doesn't want to continue the existing framework of the furlough scheme because of the fact that it quite likely is keeping a large number of people employed who otherwise probably wouldn't be. Uh, and so then a more realistic or more effective way of doing this uh, is to use a subsidy of wages for people in part-time work. Uh, in addition to that, he's expected to extend the life of four loan schemes, which is already backed just close to £60 billion in lending to companies through government guarantees. And so, as we've said before, he's going to try and uh, continue to remain adding uh, credit, if you like, or access to it in, in a favourable fashion to keep companies which are going to be under stressed conditions going forward, particularly with the uh, expectation of these restrictions likely to get more intense going forward. Um, the budget, of course, has been delayed. He, he confirmed that yesterday, but that was absolutely no surprise. Absolutely no point in, in, in having a UK budget, typically seasonally at this time of year, because if you think about what's going on, we've got a highly uncertain future now with the latest developments with COVID. And you overlay that with a uh, self-imposed mid-October uh, soft deadline for Brexit. You know, the moment he writes a budget right now is pretty much out of date because the situation is fluid and it's going to be changing a lot over the coming weeks. So therefore, it's just been delayed uh, until later this year, potentially, I guess, into into Q1 of, ne of next. Um, so when he comes out, um, it's kind of a, a similar story to the way the government handled then the press kind of leak before the Boris Johnson speech of all the measures that are going to come out. So what Rishi says today should come as no surprise for markets, really, because much of it has been drip-fed into the press already. Um, finally, a quick look at the calendar for today. These are the major data releases. You've got German IFO coming up at, at 9 o'clock this morning. Um, and then you've got a number of speakers. Um, so basically, German IFO, US jobless, and US new home sales, they are major data points. But from a speaker perspective, um, this is what the docket looks like. So incredibly busy once again. Um, and and purposefully so, you know, if if people are a little bit uh, unsure of you know and looking to clarity from the the central banks, particularly the Fed, um, then it's not uncommon for them to kind of litter the schedule or the docket with lots of speeches. Uh, and this generally is a, a tactic of um, of management or, of market uh, kind of sentiment in a way. So you've got Kaplan, Powell, of course, is testifying to the Senate Banking Committee today, this time round, having already done the House. Then you've got Bullard, Evans, Barkin, Bostick, Williams. So you're getting the full kind of roadshow. Uh, so definitely, you'll be interested to see what happens there. Um, I would say overall, um, perhaps just given sensitivity in, uh, in market prices this week, perhaps it's a little bit more reassuring. They'll continue to do whatever they can do, that type of rhetoric. Um, definitely no need for any kind of hawkish noises at this point uh, if they want to try and manage stability in markets, which is generally quite fragile right now. Um, and then the other one that's going to be really interesting is, is Andrew Bailey. He, of course, spoke back on Tuesday and it did cause some sh short-term fluctuation in sterling. A lot of um, market focus on commentary pertaining to negative rates. Uh, and he didn't really comment too much on that. Um, before and it's any explicitness around that particular policy tool uh, can be market moving. So Bailey speaking at 3 p.m. London time uh, in the North East England Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so yeah, that is it really. So hopefully that was useful. Um, any questions at all? Again, as as always, just drop me a, drop me a comment. Absolutely happy to um, to help. Uh, and also you can follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much for everyone for following. Uh, managed to get over 10,000 followers now. So uh, yeah, amazing. I'm just happy that people uh, like my macro ramblings and find value from it. So uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's all useful. All right, guys. 
enjoy your day and I'll, and I'll catch you later on. Thanks very much.